Hello everyone, sorry to be in a hustle, but I just got home from work. I'm Steve, Mark's at work, and this is Smokey Steve and Mark. Either welcome or welcome back. Happy Thursday, it's almost the weekend. Uh, first off, quick programming note, tomorrow is Friday, uh, it is Mark's birthday, so we will not be having coffee talk tomorrow. We will be having it on Saturday, so we will check in with our fair lady uh, day after tomorrow. It will not be tomorrow night, okay? Uh, September is National Suicide Awareness Prevention uh, Month. When you look up what the month is, it both show up different places. So at any rate, I want to talk a little bit about uh, mental illness, because that's where I kind of come from with it, and suicide. Uh, people who've died by suicide, my own history in and around the topic, uh, things like that. It's very prevalent. Um, it's getting, it's on the rise. <laughs> Uh, it's very relevant to me because, frankly, I meet, I'm in, like, the highest demographic of individuals who would probably be prone to dying by suicide. I'm a middle-aged white man. I'm part of the LGBTQ community, which also has a heightened rate of suicide. I have a serious mental illness. Another peg in there. Uh, what's the other one? I have a history of substance abuse. There's another one. The only thing that would make my risk factor any higher would be if we had an unsecured firearm in the house. That would be the only thing that would push it any further up. Um, I'll mention later why we don't. That's not a political issue, that's a personal choice. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I, I did a video on suicide before and talked about some of my own history with it, my own attempts, because I've, I've had about three. Um, I've had some time to reflect since the previous video I did, so some of the details and some of the reflections might be a little different from from there to here. So I'll talk a little bit about my own experience with it, not only my own, but also friends I've had who've died by suicide, and then kind of why it's important to maybe keep an eye out for each other, just keep an eye on each other if we see somebody in distress. So my own experience with um, trying to, to kill myself, caveat here, I will be talking about myself. I do this when I speak with groups of people. Suicide is not a funny topic. Serious mental illness is not a funny topic. However, I have a certain kind of dark humor and dark way of looking at my own experiences, um, at explaining them. Humor kind of lets me not feel them so deeply that they're disturbing. So when I'm going to be talking about myself in the context of this, I might drop a joke in here or there. That doesn't mean I don't take this topic seriously or that I don't think we all should. It just means that to bury some of my awkwardness and probably discomfort around the topic, I throw in a crack here or two there, okay? So I've tried to uh, commit suicide three times. Um, after each of those three, I ended up in an inpatient psychiatric unit. So immediate care followed each of these. Um, twice was by overdose, and one was by uh, cutting, by self-injury that I was attempting. Now, how can I put this diplomatically? Uh, the first two times were serious. I mean, I was, I was hoping to die at the end of it. Uh, without going into a lot of the sturm and drag of mental illness, I'll just give you the time frame. It was 2007 to 2012, so it was over that period of about five years, there was three attempts, scattered in between periods of treatment, periods of sobriety, all the other stuff that I had going on. And I remember the first time that I had tried it, it was a, it was kind of an odd situation. I had um, taken some over-the-counter medication, quite a bit of it and woke up the next morning and nothing had happened, and went to my psychiatrist to be assessed for crisis, and the doctor had said, why are you here? I said, well, I tried, I, I attempted suicide last night, and he's like, well, you're alive. I said, yeah, but I'm pissed that I woke up, and off we went to the hospital. Um, there was another time that it happened as well, and then the third time, I actually was in the middle of an episode a uh, manic episode bordering into a psychotic episode. I have bipolar disorder. And it was after a medication change that had induced that episode. And among a bunch of other symptoms I was having, I began uh, cutting myself. Uh, the, the where and why of that is, is probably a topic for another video, but suffice it to say, I, was, I had lost my capacities enough that it seemed like a good idea at the time. 
And so that was, I was in rough shape then and went to the hospital immediately, like within half an hour of that, that incident beginning, I was in a hospital. So it was addressed right away as well. Um, I'll say this, and again, this is not meant to be political, but I'll explain why I make the choices I make around this. I grew up in a house where there was a weapon. I was a nosy little kid, okay? Um, and I would go through my parents' drawers. I was probably like eight, nine, ten, something like that. And I remember finding a gun one time. It didn't scare me. It didn't surprise me. I wasn't tempted to play with it. I knew guns were dangerous um, and that you shouldn't play around with them. In my head, they were for grown-ups. You know, that's just the kind of, like, my dad wasn't a hunter, he wasn't a gun collector, so they, we didn't have them in the house. This was like a handgun. So I knew where it was, I left it. I always assumed it was still in the same spot, forever. The last time, the second time that I tried to take my own life and overdose, before I took the pills, I went looking for the gun. I was trying to go find it. Now, I believe wholeheartedly, had I found it, we wouldn't be... We wouldn't be talking. I wouldn't be talking here. Um, now, the overdose was a failed attempt. It would be the lethality, that's a word, um, of a, a, a firearm discharging, you know, where I probably would have done it. Uh, the mortality rates probably would be, I would imagine, as you would, quite a bit higher. People do survive um, gunshots to the face, but not too many. Um, so... Thankfully, that I wasn't able to access that at the time. And that goes into the reason why um, Mark and I don't keep a weapon in the house. It has nothing to do with, you know, anything like that. It's more a matter of, I've had a history of attempts in the past. And during one of those attempts, I was attempting to secure a, a firearm, or a gun, handgun, uh, to use it. So I don't need, I'm not doing myself any favors by keeping one in the house. So is that a trade-off? Yes, there are certain, you know, one could argue that there's certain benefits to having one around and that there's drawbacks. For me, the drawbacks are so much more there that I choose just not to keep it around. So that's kind of part of my safety plan, um, should something like that come up again. There's other safeguards I have in place now, too, to try to keep myself in a better spot. Um, I have a really open dialogue with Mark if I'm not feeling safe, if I'm feeling like cutting or injuring or I'm having a bad day. Um, and I don't mean your run-of-the-mill bad days, I mean those really bad ones. Um, the ones where I feel like a burden, the ones where I feel like no one will miss me, that I'm just taking up space, like all those feelings that kind of creep in. And, you know, it's not... It, it's the kind of, like, when those... If you've ever been depressed, depression's one that I think a lot of people can... Even if you don't have a diagnosis of depression, people get depressed time to time. It's the kind that sinks in and sits there, and you can't remember ever feeling any other way before, and you don't think you'll ever feel any other way ever again. It's just this despair, this like hopelessness that sets in. So keeping people in the loop with how I'm doing, social support is a big one for that. Like I have Mark, I have my parents, the folks I work with are very understanding. I would count many of them as acquaintances and friends beyond just co-workers. Like, I think if I stopped working there for any reason, I'd still stay in touch with them beyond just the hi, happy birthday on Facebook. You know, they're good people. And they're well-versed in the mental health field, too. I teach mental health first aid and how to deal with someone who's suicidal. And I taught some of them how to do it. So you never know, I might have taught them how to help me someday down the road, which would be interesting. Um, so I could reach out to them if I needed to. I'm well networked within the mental health community here too. I know the providers, I know the resources that are available. I'm in a very privileged position when it comes to that. I'll get phone calls from family members who say, um, it'll be a mother talking about, let's say her 20 year old son saying he drank a bottle of Windex and now he's in the psych ward and I don't know what's happening and he, there was no indication anything was wrong. and. And I don't know, am I a bad person? I think it's all my fault. And they just spew. Now, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a professional in that way. I'm a peer specialist, which means I have lived experience as a person with a mental health concern. And I have training to work with other people who have mental health concerns. And that lets me be trained more easily to be uh, an advocate, an educator, a presenter, 
um, do some trainings. So that's what I've been able to do. I've had those additional trainings to help out with that. I am not a counselor, uh, but talking to a parent, you know, I've had parents. I put them in the same spot that this woman was in from time to time. So I can kind of listen and appreciate it. And I'll disclose if, if I think it'll help the situation to say, I haven't been in your position. I'm not going to pretend to understand that, but I've been in your son's position and I hit it really well. So if you think you didn't know, it might be because your son was really, for any number of reasons, you might not have known. And don't, don't blame yourself for all this. Um, so I try to provide some comfort in that way. Uh, but again, I have, like I said, the privilege of knowing all these resources and a lot of other people don't. And they'll contact me to try to find where some of those resources are available. And it's not just in my own life and in the work I do. I had a, a, a short tail acquaintance from like a couple years ago in the obituaries, just like a week and a half ago. You know, it seems like maybe three times a year, somebody I know, usually from the drug and alcohol community, but not always, dies by either suicide or intentional overdose. Something like that happens to them. If I go back to my first introduction to treatment, because that's when you when I started to run in like recovery circles and you kind of see the same people over and over again, either in rehabs, which I went to about five before I got better, uh, started to get better, um, or inpatient psych units, because a lot of the same folks who have serious illnesses need a higher level of care treatment often. So I've been in the hospital with the same people a couple times because I was in the psych ward about five, five times. And trying to uh, keep track, I mean, since, what did that be, 12 years now? I mean, at least a dozen friends of mine have died. Uh, and it was weird. You know what scared me about it? This is what scared me about it. It was never the ones you would think it would be. And what was weird is that with, they were the, the friends I had met that were eerily similar to me. They were the ones who were in treatment and acted like, they were smarter than everyone. I was so smug because I was mortified what my life had turned into. So I had to hold on to something. So smugness and thinking I was smart was what was doing it. And so were these other people. They had careers. I kind of did. Um, they had some education. I had a bachelor's. You know, I had a little bit of, of education. Um, I wasn't, I didn't come from the streets or anywhere like that. I came from, you know, a good family. And they were the ones who died. Like, I think... They were high functioning, if you want to call it that. I was supposedly like a high functioning drinker. What that means, I don't know exactly. Uh, I could hold a job for a little while. I used to be able to drink at work and still function when I was drinking. Mind you, I haven't had a drink at this point in years. Um, but it was something I used to be able to do. And they were the folks who passed away. They were the ones who died. You know, I'm just going back. I'm thinking like, there was John and Ron and Kimberly. And what really set me off thinking about this, actually, I did a video on my friend Willie. Willie was someone I met in treatment in 2012. And Willie was my first friend after six years. When you're drunk all the time, no one wants to be your friend. And your friends at the time run away. And I didn't get it at the time, but I understand why now. They just had to save themselves. So they, they scattered. They stopped returning phone calls. They stopped returning you know, DMs and, and messages on Facebook and stuff. And I was pissed at the time, but I understand why now. And it was, you know, kind of lonely. So from 2007 to 2012, I didn't have any friends. You know, Mark was in the picture as a friend because we had met in treatment, but he was, we were writing letters and talking, you know, until he had actually moved in. And he only moved in four months before I went to treatment. So Willie was the first person who actually enjoyed my company in a long time. That was a big deal to me. I cried when I was leaving treatment. Willie was funny too. He was the only, God forgive me, the only white guy with dreadlocks that I ever met that I liked. <laughs> and um, he was cool. Very hard life, hardcore drinker, hardcore heroin addict, was just barely getting better and he was holding on. And he also had some serious mental health issues. He used to hallucinate from time to time. And it'd be funny, his eyes would start to track. I'm like, Willie, what do you see? And he's like, ah, the usual. Um, and he'd laugh and then we would just go on with the rest of, you know, treatment or whatever we were doing. So, and then he passed away. 
And I met a guy the other day who looked just like him. And this was the time of year that Willie had passed away too. And it all kind of flooded back. And then I'm thinking it's suicide month. And I'm, it just got onto my mind. Um, you know, I had the privilege of knowing all of them. It's unfortunate that that's how their lives ended. You know, and I even had the regret of, God, why didn't I call Willie more? You know, we fell out of touch by phone. I should have just called him. I could, I sh would that have stopped anything? I don't know. But I would have been able to talk to him one last time. You know, it's hard to think the last time I spoke to him was going to be the last time I spoke to him. You know, it didn't occur to me that that was going to be the case. And I hate to be so glib and so kind of numb about it, but it's happened over and over so many times. You know, I think I remember talking very briefly, like in a minute or two. My step-grandmother who passed away, Alice, she was 93. When she was in her 80s, I was sick. Um, and we were looking at the newspaper one time and she's like as many of her friends as mine were in the obituaries every week, you know, because somebody else would die by addiction. And a lot of the obituaries actually locally are starting to say died by addiction, died by this, died by that, by untreated mental illness, things like that, which is good. I think that's awareness raising for addiction. Died by suicide appears maybe once or twice. It'll usually say died at home. So when someone who's like 30 years old or younger dies unexpectedly in the obits here, they either died by overdose, suicide, or an all-terrain vehicle accident. There's not too many other things that take a person out at that age range around here. So, you know, I kind of made it through my own demons and came up with a plan to how to protect myself. And I've kind of learned to cope with other people who are having, you know, who may exit my life suddenly by that. Um, I have concerns about people in my life now who may be uh, not doing well. And I think all, you know, all I can do is just be there for them and be a soundboard and be available. Uh, there's another person, there's some, there's a couple people I'm very concerned about at the moment. Um, not super close, they're acquaintances, they're further out. But I feel like after so much time around it, I have a nose for it, which is, still makes it uncomfortable. I mean, how do you text someone out of the blue and say, hey, you're thinking about killing yourself? You know, I mean, asking someone directly is, and that's an evidence-based bit of things, is the best way to do it. Not, are you thinking of hurting yourself? Not, are you having bad thoughts? It's, are you thinking about killing yourself? Just boom, directly. It's not going to put the idea in their head. It's, it's how to get a straight answer. It might give them some relief to have someone just even ask. Um, and then if they say yes, you know, t you take it from there. But, I mean, I have my own way of dealing with mine. I can kind of cope with other people's, but then there's the larger issue of it's just going on everywhere, you know, and as something of a, something of an advocate, I like to think myself as. I've said suicide so many times, I know this is going to be demonetized, so as long as we're going for it, I'm having a cigarette. Smoky Stephen Mark, this is where it came, I almost never smoke on camera, but this is a heavy topic. So... There's really, it affects everybody. I mean, if you look at statistics and all that stuff, and I had some written down, and I did it for the last one, and I threw them away there too, because you could all Google those. But in just talking about the big numbers of groups that it impacts, it impacts everybody. Like, the one of the biggest demographics, is not the, is middle-aged white guys. Like, 35 to 50, something like that. Um, in rural areas, too. You know, this is not an urban problem or a rural problem. Um, seniors are one of the highest growing groups, like people over 80. Locally, it's been a huge issue here. I live in Pennsylvania. And folks over senior citizens who are doing it. And they do it, they just refuse to take their meds or they stop eating. And it's not due to illness or side effects. It's just, you know, passive suicide. Um, LGBTQ, especially youth. Uh, transgender, forget it. Transgender youth, I mean, the rate of suicide attempts is through the roof. Um, veterans. Veterans have been done a great disservice as far as being offered supports um, to help them stay mentally well. You know, they, 20 a day, 22 a day. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Um, it's an awful thing that unites all these diverse communities, and that is some internal issue that pushes people to want to end their lives. 
you know, like I said, it's such a diverse cross section of humanity, but there's that, that bit of something in common. So what is it, you know, what is it that, that all these people have that's pushing them to that extreme? These are big questions. <laughs> these are big questions for a Thursday afternoon chit chat. Um, I don't know. You know, and what can I do? What can you do? What can I do? You know, if you're only watching this because you like Smokey Stephen Mark and you don't give a rat's ass about mental health, um, do you even care? You know, not everybody does. Not everyone feels called to reach out to someone in that position. They may have another, you know, moral vocation that's more important to them. But I think just checking in on the people in our lives, even if only in our circle that we know may be vulnerable, even if we don't, look, it's it's easy to love the lovable ones, okay? I, I will speak for myself as a person with a mental illness. We're tough to deal with. We can be obnoxious. We can suck the life out of you um, with our neediness and our depression. We'll like, be like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. You know, we're not saints. We will cuss you up and down, say get out of our house, call you an hour later and say I need you, come back. Like, if you've been the caretaker of someone in your family, or a friend, or a neighbor, anybody, you know how this shakes down. You know how this goes. Um, so I'm not saying it's easy to do. I had a sponsor when I used to do the 12-step thing who would say, you know, it's easy to love the lovable ones. And that's very true. I think that's very true. But, you know, I feel kind of a, I don't know, I hate to say vocation. You know, I grew up I grew up Catholic. I don't practice anymore, but I think service is a good thing to do. Granted, I get paid probably less than most pastors, but still, it's it's something I feel compelled to do. I would do it even if I wasn't getting paid, just because I feel like it's the right thing to do to not let people who are struggling linger. And because I kind of understand mental health maybe more than most people, because I've dealt with it myself, those are the kind of folks I feel compelled to reach out to. Um, but just looking out for each other, just taking care of each other, and especially folks who seem to be vulnerable. Um, young children are especially vulnerable. Teenagers are vulnerable. I'm not going to wade into bullying because that shouldn't be controversial, but it is. Um, so I'll leave that aside. I'll say, I can say to you, I was depressed from being kind of more like ostracized than bullied. I didn't go to school with mean kids. I just didn't fit in, is all. Um, and that had an impact on my mental health. I didn't contemplate um, suicide, but I did, uh, I did want to do things like escape, like run away, transfer schools. I did want to get away from the situation. So if school had been three years longer, <laughs> you know, if senior year was three years instead of one, maybe I would have felt differently. I don't know. So, is there a big happy bow to put on at the end of this? Well, there's some hope, I guess. Uh, some of us live. Some of us go on. Some of us have caring people who intervened. You know, my family was able to intervene. I've had therapists who've intervened. I had strangers walking down the street. I do. Random people have made a big difference sometimes. I remember walking down the street half drunk, crying, and... The random person will say, excuse me, are you okay? And I would say, you know, I'm fine and keep walking. But it reminded me that I wasn't invisible. It reminded me that I was there, that I was a person, that I was alive, that I wasn't a ghost yet. Just the littlest thing like that can make a big difference. It wasn't a grand extension of themselves that they were making. It was just, hey, are you all right? Are you okay? Maybe if I had said yes, I would have gotten some help sooner, but that's on me. That's not on them. So I guess that's the only happy, happy bow call to action, um, suggestion, uh, prayer for, for the whole situation is, uh, you know, be kind, be kind to each other. People are going through hard times and some of us hide it better than others. You know, there's plenty of folks I know who've passed away and they say, there was no signs. There was no indication. They were doing okay. And it can look like that. And then someone goes. But sometimes if you do see things that look suspicious, if it looks like someone's slipping away and you're hesitant to say something, say it. 
what's the worst they're going to say? No. Are you thinking of hurting yourself or killing yourself or thinking of killing yourself? And they say no. Good. You know. Can you trust them? You asked. You can only do so much and then the rest is on them. But if you're in a good spot to do it, I would strongly encourage you to put yourself out there and be that person who says, are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? Within reason. Do what you can to help. You know, don't promise things you can't do. But if you have two minutes to talk, talk to the person. If the person says, no, I'm not okay, you know, get them to a pay phone. Grab their phone for them. Have them call a friend. Let them use your phone for a minute to call somebody. Something simple. Simple little things. Notice I'm not giving, like, medical advice here. Because unless you're a medical professional, you'll know what to do. I'm not a medical professional. I'm just trying to think in terms of being a decent human being. What are some simple things that you would extend to anybody having a hard time? Um, if you're the kind of person who's comfortable extending yourself to strangers, do that. You know, I do it with strangers, but I do it at work, so I'm paid to do it. It's a little bit different. But even on the streets, I'll, I stop and talk to people I probably shouldn't walk past. So, so that's our discussion about suicide. How it affects the individual, how it affects the community, um, how it can impact all of us. I hope it hasn't impacted you, and I hope it doesn't. But if it has, I hope, um at least seeing a video about it lets you know that it's not that taboo. I hope there's other videos that are out there right now on YouTube about it because it is something that needs more awareness raised. It's like, it seems silly, suicide awareness. Is anyone not aware that suicide is going on? Yes. But who is it happening to? Why is it happening? And is there anything any of us can do to help? That was kind of what I wanted to have a talk about. So I hope we kind of hit on some of that. So thank you all for watching. Please do subscribe, hit the like button. You can follow Mark and I on Facebook at Smokey Steve Space and Mark, or on Instagram at Smokey Steve and Mark. Our email address and contact information is listed below. Uh, thank you for watching, and we will catch up with y'all soon. Bye. Be nice. Take care of each other.